The Fifth Estate. Tonight, 9-11, the most closely examined day in history, yet one of the most mysterious. So much secrecy. And because they're classified, I can't tell you what's in those uh, pages. And so many questions, like what did George Bush know, and when did he know it? I saw an airplane hit the tower of a, of a TV, you know, the TV was obviously on. We'll show you why the president couldn't have seen what he said he saw, and why there's still so much suspicion. The attack was made with uh, another method. Tonight, we'll go beyond the conspiracy theories to reveal some startling facts, facts you likely have not heard before. And now, Bob McEwen. Welcome to a new season of The Fifth Estate, and to some old questions that just won't go away. This week, a high-level U.S. investigation into 9-11 threatened to take the White House to court to find out what it knew before the terror attacks. Secrecy still runs that deep. What really did happen on September the 11th? Did airliners follow homing beacons into the World Trade Center? Was the Pentagon struck not by a jet, but a missile? Was there a close link between the Bush and bin Laden families? And could that help to explain the failure to avert the attacks? Well, as we'll show you, the answers there are no, no, yes, and perhaps, but with so many questions still circulating in our murky post-9-11 world, an entire industry has grown up peddling answers, conspiracy theories, at once both far-fetched and enticing. We've investigated, and what we discovered may well surprise you, because once we dug past the 9-11 myths, the facts we found were in their own way just as troubling. September 11, 2001, Lindsay, Ontario, just after 8.45 a.m. The morning was unfolding as usual at the local jail on Victoria Avenue, inmates back in their cells after breakfast, when it happened. One of the prisoners in Lindsay that day was a man named Delmart Vreeland, called Mike. You've likely never heard of him, but to many, Mike Freeland has become a symbol of what we know about 9-11 and what we don't. Michael Rupert knows all about Vreeland, a former Los Angeles cop turned 9-11 investigator. On his website, Rupert pulls together information from every corner of the Internet that he claims proves the official versions of the tragic events of September 11th are blatantly false. They don't stand the slightest uh, sniff test scratch from anybody who's a trained investigator who's willing to set aside their emotions and just look at the evidence. 9-11 was not an intelligence failure. 9-11 was an intelligence success. It was supposed to happen. And Rupert says Delmart Mike Vreeland is a key to all of it. So who exactly was that mystery inmate at the Lindsay Jail? Well, here's what we know for sure. Mike Freeland was an American awaiting a trial here in Toronto for credit card fraud. The police said he had a criminal record more than 20 pages long in the U.S. Freeland himself said that was just a cover story to disguise what he really was, an American spy working for the Pentagon. But here's where it gets interesting. According to Freeland, about a month before September the 11th, he tried to warn Canadian and American authorities something terrible was going to happen. When no one listened to him, he says he gave his jail guards a sheet of paper, which was sealed and kept unopened until long after 9-11. That October, at a Toronto court, Vreeland's lawyers entered a sheet of paper as evidence. On it were various words and phrases, including World Trade Center, Pentagon, and what they said was Bin Laden. They insisted it was a list of 9-11 targets that Vreeland had uncovered and had been trying to warn the authorities about. In court, police and prosecutors described Vreeland as a career con man, and the judge found no basis to believe his claims. We can't ask him about any of it because Vreeland jumped bail and disappeared. But on the internet, he remains a poster boy for those who believe September 11th was planned as an excuse for the American war on terror. The moment in time when the world accepted that the intelligence justifying the invasion of Iraq was a lie 
that we were sold a war on false pretenses, then 9-11 has to be on the table, too. Clearly, the United States government could have prevented the attacks, and the United States government held the door open and allowed those attacks to happen. That seems to be the common denominator of most 9-11 conspiracy theories, that somehow the U.S. government knew those attacks were coming, yet let them take place anyway. But there is one man who goes well beyond that, who because of it has become perhaps the most infamous conspiracy theorist of all. His name is Thierry Messin, and his book about 9-11, The Big Lie, was a bestseller in Europe. His website lays out a conspiracy theory that challenges the official story of the September 11th attack on the Pentagon. What we've been told, of course, is that about half an hour after the first two planes crashed into the Twin Towers in New York, a third hijacked aircraft, American Airlines Flight 77, hit the U.S. Defense Headquarters in Washington, killing everyone on board and 125 on the ground. Thierry Messin isn't an engineer, but he says he took one look at the smoldering ruins and knew the official story it was impossible. According to the official version, a big plane with uh, uh, 38 meters large and uh, 12 meters high mm -hmm. uh, enter uh, in, a small, uh, in a small door like that into the Pentagon and disappeared. That's ob obviously stupid. The attack was made with uh, another method. What other method of attack, you might well ask? Given the size of the hole in the Pentagon and the lack of large pieces of debris, Messin concludes the impact could only have been caused by something much smaller than a 767, like a surface-to-air missile. And who could have been behind that? The same people responsible for the destruction of the World Trade Center, says Messin. President George W. Bush and U.S. officials. Are you saying you believe George Bush knew about this beforehand? What I think is that uh, George Bush knew a very small part of the problem. But you know what? If he knew one part before, yes. you're saying he knows it all now. And you're saying... Yes, of course. So you're talking about mass murder. You're accusing him of being a heinous criminal. No. When uh, Mr. Bush decided to uh, make uh, bombardments in, uh, in Iraq, how many people he kills? W what is the difference? While there was a lot of general intelligence at the time about the possibility of a terrorist attack on American soil, before we go any further, let's be perfectly clear about one thing. We have found no credible evidence that the U.S. government was involved in or had specific advanced knowledge of exactly what would happen on September the 11th. And let's face it, most conspiracy theories pretty much seem like a waste of time, either because they depend on questionable characters like Mike Vreeland or revolve around wild accusations like those of Thierry Messin. By the way, we've reviewed Messin's theories with aviation experts who tell us in their opinion the official stories of what happened at the Pentagon and World Trade Center are consistent with the known facts of both crash scenes. But there's something else to consider here. Because conspiracy theories, as implausible, even offensive as they may seem, are almost always based, at least in part, on legitimate questions. Questions that have remained unanswered since September 11th. You can find them on the internet, too. And these days, it's not only those on the fringe who are asking, for example, it's difficult to understand why, in what is some of the most heavily defended airspace in the world, it took almost 30 minutes to scramble jet fighters to protect the U.S. Capitol, too late to prevent American Flight 77 from slamming into the Pentagon. The military's explained that's simply how long it took for the order to be given. And you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to wonder exactly what President George W. Bush knew about the attack, and when he knew it. According to the official White House version, it was at this moment in a Florida classroom 
that Bush learned the second plane had hit the World Trade Center and that the U.S. was under attack. But here's what George Bush himself said almost three months later when asked about September 11th. I had, was sitting outside uh, the, the, the classroom waiting to go in, and I saw an airplane hit the tower of a, of a TV. You know, the TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself, and I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And uh, I said, it must have been a horrible accident. But I was whisked off there. I didn't have much time to think about it. Now, wait a minute. George Bush was told about the second plane while he was inside the classroom. So you just heard him describe seeing the first plane crash on television that day. But that's impossible. No one saw the first plane crash on TV on September the 11th because the videotape of it didn't surface until the next day. So how could George Bush have seen what he said he saw? Of course, there's always the possibility the president simply misspoke. He has been known to do that. But that's precisely the point. It's that kind of inconsistency, especially on the most thoroughly documented day in history, on which conspiracy theories are built. And as we'll soon show you, there's a lot about what happened before and after September 11th that demands a closer look. When we come back, conspiracy or coincidence? The long, tangled history of the Bush family and the elite of Saudi Arabia. A very nice reunion with friends. I'm very pleased to be here. And the young George Bush goes into the oil business, backed by some rich and powerful friends of his own. Do you have any knowledge of how much money the Saudis put in? Well, he told me it was in excess of, you know, a million dollars. And George W. Bush would have been aware of that? Oh, absolutely. And now we return to the fifth estate. Think of it as a conspiracy theory, true or false test. A. When George W. Bush started his first oil company, who helped fund it? Osama bin Laden's brother and brother-in-law. True or false? B. After a terrorist bomb at a barracks in Saudi Arabia killed 19 Americans, who got the multi-million dollar contract to rebuild? The Bin Ladens. True or false? C. On the morning of September 11, 2001, who was in a meeting at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Washington? George Bush Sr. and Osama Bin Laden's brother. True or false? Actually, the answer could be D, all of the above. Because believe it or not, as far-fetched as they sound, each and every one of those things, the Bin Laden link to the Bush Oil Company, the Bin Laden construction contract after the terrorist bomb, and the Bin Laden-Bush meeting on 9-11 is true. And what that means is that on that awful morning two years ago, the day everything seemed to change, the world was already a far more complicated place than most of us could even imagine. In order to truly understand what happened on September the 11th and the close relationship between the Bushes, the Bin Ladens, and the rest of the Saudi elite, you have to go back about 25 years and south a couple of thousand kilometers to Houston, Texas, where in the mid-1970s, George W. Bush was a young man just trying to learn the ropes in his family's two businesses, politics and oil. The Bushes were a pillar of Houston society. George Sr. struck it rich in oil, became a congressman, then director of the Central Intelligence Agency, where it's said he first won the friendship of the Saudi royal family by arranging CIA training for their palace guards. And George Jr. was trying to follow in his father's footsteps. A Harvard business grad, he dabbled in politics and the Texas Air National Guard. And it was about the same time that a man named Bill White a former fighter pilot with a Harvard MBA himself, was recruited to work in Houston with someone with business and personal connections to both George Bushes. His name was Jim Bath. This fellow, James R. Bath, needed someone to run a series of real estate companies that would be um, grub staked by not only the political families, but also by some foreign nationals, the Saudis. And so I came down on an interview and 
met Jim. They opened an office in downtown Houston, where Bill White became Jim Bath's partner and confidant. But White says Bath spent most of his time dealing with his foreign partners, a wealthy Saudi family, the Bin Ladens. He also ran a company in the same building called Bin Laden and Associates, which Jim explained was a procurement company for the Saudis. He bought a bank for them. He bought an airport for them. He started an airline for them, among other ventures in Houston, Texas. Now, at that point, had you ever heard the name Bin Laden? No, I had not. Meant nothing to you? Meant nothing to me. But in Saudi Arabia, the Bin Laden's name meant a great deal indeed. They owned one of the largest Saudi construction companies. They were advisors to the royal family. They were the second richest family next to the royals, with billions of dollars to invest abroad in places like Houston, where the Bush family lives. They moved into this estate in one of Houston's finest neighborhoods. A Bin Laden brother named Salam Bin Laden and a brother-in-law, Khalid Bin Mafus. Mafus was also one of the Saudi royal family's bankers. So is it fair to say that when the Bin Laden group establishes an office in Houston, the presence of the Bush family at that point had a lot to do with it? Oh, absolutely. I think that was essential, the essential element. I don't think any of those dollars would have come into the United States or any of those assets been purchased had not there been this quid pro quo relationship with the, with the Bush family. While the Bin Ladens built their ties to Texas, back home in Saudi Arabia, they were making another kind of foreign investment. In 1979, the Soviet Union occupied Afghanistan. The Saudi royal family wanted to build a Muslim army, known as the Mujahideen, to defend Islam and force the Russians out. They turned to their trusted advisors, the Bin Ladens, who offered up a lanky 21-year-old named Osama. The man who personally chose Osama bin Laden to build that army would also become his mentor, Saudi Prince Turki Al Faisal. Last year on British television, he reminisced about the young bin Laden. In those days, he was uh, a young man who had uh, committed himself to helping the Afghan Mujahideen uh, liberate themselves from the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and uh, he was doing a lot of good. Uh, he was uh, bringing uh, support and aid to the Mujahideen. Meanwhile, back in Houston, the Bush family was also on the move. George Sr. was about to become vice president, and his son made a career decision too. By the late 70s, George W. Bush was setting out on his own. He established an oil exploration company that he called Arbusto. A Spanish word that loosely translated means bush. But before Arbusto could find oil, it needed to find some money, operating capital. And apparently George Bush knew where to look. Well, Bath had told me that he had used Saudi money to fund George Bush Jr.'s foray into the energy business. This is the Arbusto Corporation? Yes, the Arbusto Partnerships. As Bath's partner, Bill White, says he had access to information about the financial dealings between the Bin Laden family and George W. Bush. He later obtained Bath's personal financial statements when the two had a falling out and became involved in litigation. On schedules that show his partnership interests, he shows a personal partnership interest of $25,000 invested in Arbusto 79 and another $25,000 investment in, in Bush 80. But according to White, that share was only Bath's commission for investing the Bin Laden's money with Bush. Do you have any knowledge of how much money the Saudis put in? Well, he told me it was in excess of, you know, a million dollars. So there is no question in your mind whatsoever that whatever went into George W. Bush's companies from Jim Bath was money well, from the Saudis. One hundred percent of it was Saudi money. And George W. Bush would have been aware of that? Oh, absolutely. But that wasn't all. A few years later, another oil company in which George W. Bush was involved needed cash. It got a reported $25 million, again, thanks in part to Bush's old Houston neighbor, Khalid bin Mafus, Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law. And it wasn't only George Bush the son who benefited. The bin Ladens did business with the Houston bank where George Bush Sr. was on the board. What time is it? Victory, Victory time. time. <laughs> this is the non-political part of this. Come on. And businessman Bill White says whether Bush Sr. knew it or not, the Bin Ladens were also generous with him when he ran for president in 1988, 
allegedly finding a way around the U.S. ban on foreign campaign contributions. My understanding from Bath was that they were making campaign contributions by taking briefcases full of cash to the law firms. They would give the cash to the lawyers, and each of the lawyers in turn would make a $1,000 campaign contribution to Bush. Which would presumably be against electoral law in the U.S. Well, it is against the law, but it's obviously covered by virtue of the attorneys making the contributions. And when George Bush Sr. became president, as with George W. more than a decade later, the Saudis occupied a special place at the White House. The Oval Office always open to one man, Saudi Arabia's ambassador, Prince Bandar. He's got instant access. He calls him up, says, I'm coming over. He's got instant access to the CIA, anybody he wants. He can summon people. He can call anybody up at home at any time, which most ambassadors in Washington cannot do. Robert Baer served with the CIA for 21 years and spent much of that time in the Middle East. What is the George W. Bush calls Bondar? Bondar Bush? Bondar Bush, yeah, calls him Bondar Bush. You know, that's fine. Bondar's a great ambassador. It works great until you turn a blind eye, until you believe everything Bondar says. Bear believes that Bondar's position is symptomatic of the blind self-interest on both sides. That's the Saudi-American relationship's fatal flaw. As you'll see when we come back, it's a lesson George W. Bush and his administration wouldn't learn until it was much too late. Had Saudi Arabia been acting as one might expect a true ally and friend to act, could they have told the U.S. all they needed to know about the real threat posed by bin Laden? They knew everything. They were the source of fundings that went to, to buy arms, to buy bombs through their charities, and those charities in Saudi Arabia are all controlled by the government to some extent. And now we return to the fifth estate. Ladies and gentlemen, America's first combat pilot. It was 1991. The Gulf War was over. American troops had defended Saudi oil fields against Saddam Hussein. Now the U.S. could continue to enjoy the economic security which came with all that Saudi oil. It was essentially the same deal George W. Bush himself made when he did business with the bin Ladens in Houston. One side got a powerful partner, the other oil and money. Former CIA agent Robert Baer. The United States depends upon Saudi Arabia for its oil production. Uh, Saudi Arabia also recycles all the money it makes off oil in the United States and puts trillions of dollars in our banks, it pays for presidential libraries, anything you can imagine. And the Clinton White House wasn't immune to Saudi charm either. It was difficult not to give the benefit of the doubt to the biggest buyer of American military hardware with the deepest pockets in the stock market, not to mention the world's largest oil reserves. Which is why after George Bush Sr. left office and became a senior advisor to the powerful international investment firm, the Carlyle Group, he paid a number of visits on their behalf to his good friends, the Saudi royal family and the Bin Laden. This is a very nice reunion with friends. I'm very pleased to be here. They soon became Carlyle clients. Incredibly, on September 11th, Bush and the head of the Bin Laden family would be at the same Carlisle Group meeting in Washington, just a few miles from where Osama Bin Laden's hijackers would attack the Pentagon. As the 90s unfolded, there was much the U.S. administration didn't know about Bin Laden, who was about to become America's nightmare because he saw the presence of U.S. troops on the holy sands of Saudi Arabia as a sacrilege. Osama bin Laden was an ally of the United States through the 80s. He was killing Soviet soldiers. That's what we wanted. Now, what happened later on in the 90s is the Saudis, who certainly had good intelligence on bin Laden, were not telling us that bin Laden had chosen a new enemy, and that was the United States. And the Saudis left something else out, something they've tried to hide to this day that they kept paying Osama bin Laden after his war with the Soviets ended and his terror campaign against the U.S. began. 
The man who has uncovered the proof of that is Jean-Charles Brissard. He investigated Al-Qaeda's finances for the French intelligence service well before 9-11, and he's been following the relationship between bin Laden and Saudi Arabia, especially with his mentor, Prince Turki, ever since. He was helped by the kingdom, and this support lasted for years. So Turkey, for instance, was, was the one who met uh, regularly with, with bin Laden in Afghanistan. Oh, until very recently, until 98, I think the last time, for at least three or four times, who sent him checks, full suitcases of, of money, trucks. All that suggests that he was clearly supported by the Saudi government itself. Brissard says though bin Laden despised the royal family, he secretly agreed to set that hostility aside in exchange for continuing financial support. In other words, protection money. The Saudis deny it ever happened. But according to investigator Jean-Charles Brissard, French intelligence reports confirm that a meeting did indeed take place in Paris in 1996. Osama bin Laden himself didn't come, but a senior representative did. Also in attendance, bin Laden's old mentor, Saudi Prince Turki, a bin Laden family member, and a number of bankers. The result? The Saudis promised to keep paying bin Laden as long as he promised to keep ignoring them. According to Brissard, one of those who came to this Paris hotel for that meeting was none other than bin Laden's brother-in-law, Khalid bin Mahfouz, the same man who once financially supported George W. Bush, now negotiating payoffs to Osama bin Laden. And support came from the bin Laden family as well. They publicly proclaimed they'd disowned Osama, but privately, Brissard says, they sent him equipment and money the company like the Saudi Bin Laden Group is providing uh, all the tools to Osama Bin Laden to build a road uh, or an airport in Sudan. Yes, they're clearly financial backers of Osama Bin Laden, yeah. So how much in all did the Saudis contribute to Al-Qaeda? Estimates are that before 9-11, Bin Laden spent about 50 million U.S. dollars a year, the vast majority of them from Saudi Arabia. What exactly is that? That's um, one of the documents that were recently seized by our team in Afghanistan, signed mm -hmm. by Mullah. From Bosnia to the Sudan and Afghanistan, Jean-Charles Brissard has discovered an al-Qaeda paper trail that he says proves what the Saudis are still denying. This leads you to believe it's $2 million, which originates where? Oh, it is stated that it originates from the head that is provided by yeah. Saudi Arabia. Millions in Saudi foreign aid diverted to Al-Qaeda. Financial support for terrorist training camps in Afghanistan like this one. Camps run with money, funneled through a Saudi charity, funded, managed and supervised by royal family members. They knew everything. They were the source of fundings that went to, to buy arms, to buy bombs through their charities. And those charities in Saudi Arabia are all controlled by the government to some extent. Knowing the way he felt yeah. about the U.S., knowing he had declared war essentially on, on all Americans, yeah. Yeah. would they not also have known that by giving him money they were funding ultimately don't, attacks against the U.S.? Don't you think that the interest of Saudi Arabia from its perspective is more important than the U.S. interest of the U.S.? That's what we experienced, that's what we've seen in the past. Not only did the Saudis not want to tell the Americans about their deal with bin Laden, it seems the U.S. didn't want to hear, despite the decades increasing terror attacks against Americans abroad. 1995, a bomb in Saudi Arabia kills five U.S. soldiers. 1996, 19 American servicemen die in another Saudi bombing at the U.S. military's Kobar Towers barracks. 1998, more than 200 perish when truck bombs devastate two U.S. embassies in Africa. 2000, an explosion tears apart the USS Cole. 17 American sailors are killed. Though Osama bin Laden was obviously responsible for the majority of those deaths, U.S. intelligence effectively ignored the place that was his recruitment hotbed. The U.S. attitude remained, hear, see, and speak no evil. Even though there had been the bombings 
in 95, 96, 98, and 2000, all involving Saudis. No one asked for a national intelligence estimate if Saudi Arabia is uh, a new, new terrorist state. Is it fair to say financial and political interests in one way or other led to 9-11, Afghanistan, and Iraq? Absolutely. Financial interests were predominant in Washington. They led to a turning a blind eye to what was happening in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and contributed to 9-11. But it doesn't have to be a conspiracy. This is where people will nail you if you say it's a conspiracy. It's, not, it's, a, it's a conspiracy of silence. We're just not going to talk about it. When we come back, what they still don't want to talk about how American law enforcement might have discovered and disrupted the 9-11 attacks. The agent in San Diego testified to you that he believed if he'd known, he could have stopped September He believes 11. he would have. I mean, he could, no one can ever say for sure we would have stopped it, but he believes he would have had a very good chance. And now we return to the fifth estate. Mere minutes after the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered the grounding of all civilian air traffic in the U.S. Travelers were stranded across the country and around the world. 48 hours later, September 13th, an update. Private flights were still prohibited. To take off required government approval at the highest level. That morning, Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia visited the White House. And later that day, something unusual began to happen. Despite the blanket aviation ban, several private planes, from Lear jets to a 747, were cleared to depart from various U.S. cities. On board were dozens of the Saudi elite, almost every one of Bin Laden or a Saudi royal. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Alderman was desperate to find a way from Paris to New York, where her son Peter was missing. The Bin Laden family, whoever was in the United States, got safe passage home. And I couldn't get home to be with my children. Other families couldn't get to New York, who lived far away, to even begin to look for their children. At this point, we didn't know who was alive or who was dead. I couldn't get home, and the Bin Laden family were all able to get home. To this day, the Bush administration has not even confirmed the existence of those flights to Saudi Arabia. Though Saudi diplomatic sources have been quoted as saying approval for them was granted at the highest level. That the exodus to Saudi Arabia happened at all is one thing. But then there was the investigation that took place before the Saudis departed. It seems there was none. The biggest crime in American history orchestrated by Osama bin Laden with funds from the bin Laden and Saudi royal families, plane loads of whom were given special dispensation to leave the U.S. almost immediately afterwards, essentially with no interviews to determine what they might know. No, they just got up and left. The FBI has is, is, is not been allowed to put Saudis on a terrorism list up until September 11th. They were not allowed to ask these people any questions. The President of the United States. The next week, George W. Bush finally threw down the gauntlet on global terror, or so it seemed. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. By then, the Bush administration knew that despite years of Saudi reassurance, 15 of the 19 hijackers had been Saudi nationals. So in the terrible aftermath of September 11, surely it was now time to track down those who provided money and support for 9-11 wherever they might be, right? Wrong again, according to former CIA insider Robert Baer. When George W. Bush says, terrorists, those who harbor them, those who give support to them, are our enemies. That's obviously not true because everybody that financed September 11th is currently in Saudi Arabia and free. 
I mean, it would be sort of like if bin Laden had said, well, you know, it's just a coincidence my guys happen to run into your towers. Are we just going to leave him alone? In the past two years, the U.S. has relentlessly prosecuted its war on terror, first invading Afghanistan, which unquestionably harbored and supported al-Qaeda, then occupying Iraq, which had virtually nothing to do with Osama bin Laden. But despite all their with us or against us rhetoric, the U.S. has given Saudi Arabia, which spawned the mastermind, the manpower, and the money for 9-11, a free pass. The CIA, for example, ignored intelligence about the hijackers gathered by a number of foreign countries before and after September 11th. The Fifth Estate has obtained documents like these phone records from German intelligence showing calls made by key members of the 9-11 plot to Saudi Arabia that the Americans chose not to pursue. And nowhere was that attitude more obvious than in the report of the congressional investigation into the September 11th attacks. The community made mistakes prior to September 11th. And the, the hearings on Capitol Hill began several months after 9-11. They were to be the definitive inquiry into what happened and why, focusing on what U.S. intelligence agencies knew or should have known. Eleanor Hill was the committee's chief investigator. In the fall of 1998, the intelligence community received information concerning a bin Laden a plot involving aircraft. The much anticipated report was more than 800 pages long, but since it was released this past summer, most of the attention has focused on 28 of those pages, one chapter that is almost completely redacted, ordered classified by the White House and blacked out to the public. And because they're classified, I can't tell you what's in those uh, pages. I can tell you that the chapter deals with uh, information that our committees found in FBI and CIA files that was uh, very cons disturbing. It had to do with sources of foreign support for the hijackers or alleged sources of foreign support for the hijackers. Yeah. Now, I know it is believed and has been reported that many of those 27 or 28 redacted pages deal with the Saudi relationship to the hijackers, but... That's what the press has said. I haven't said that. <laughs> In fact, others familiar with those 28 blacked out pages confirm that much of the secret material about foreign support for the 9-11 hijackers does indeed deal with Saudi Arabia. What's more, some of the classified material also appears in unclassified areas of the report. In other words, if you know where to look, there's more than enough there to reveal exactly what it is the Bush administration would prefer the public doesn't know. So Eleanor Hill could tell us the story of a Saudi government employee based in California, a man named Omar al-Bayoumi. According to the report, at least one, the FBI's best source in San Diego, suggested Bayoumi may be a Saudi intelligence officer. You can then say that Mr. Bayoumi, according to the report, did certainly help and assist the hijackers, at least two of them. Those two 9-11 hijackers were Khalid al-Madar and Nawaf al-Hazmi. They were Saudis, too, and reportedly the first of the 19 hijackers to enter the U.S. Guess who was there to meet them? Basically, Mr. Bayoumi had uh, significant contacts with Midhar and Hazmi in California. He uh, put down the deposit for them on their apartment there. He threw a party for them. Helped them enroll in flight school. Helped them enroll. And he tasked another individual to act as their translator, helped them enroll in flight schools. Not only does the congressional report detail the Saudi support for those two hijackers, it also reveals how much American intelligence already knew about them by the time they got to San Diego. They'd been under surveillance at a high-level al-Qaeda meeting abroad, where U.S. agents certainly suspected they were planning future terror attacks. The CIA knew their names, birth dates, passport numbers. They knew one of them had a U.S. entry visa, which likely meant they'd planned to travel there. But despite it all, the CIA somehow neglected to warn other U.S. agencies about them which meant that Almidar and Al-Hazmi were able to enter the country without a problem and settle in San Diego, even amazingly renew their U.S. visas so they could stay legally until they played their part on September the 11th. Congressional investigator Eleanor Hill says it was perhaps the single most crucial intelligence failure before 9-11. Had the FBI been told that and been aware of that um, back in January 2000, 
uh, things may have been very different. We had the FBI agent from San Diego who handled that informant testify in our closed hearing uh, that he believes that had he had that information from the CIA, he would have been able to stop this because he believes he would have had a, what he called a full court press in terms of investigation on Midhar and Hosni while they were living in San Diego. But in fact, it wasn't until August 2001 that the two Saudis in San Diego were finally put on the U.S. watch list. By then, it was tragically too late. Three weeks afterwards, they crashed American Airlines Flight 77 into the Pentagon. He was terrific. He was terrific. He really knew how to enjoy his life. And he made the people around him enjoy their lives more. Elizabeth Alderman lost her son at the World Trade Center. Now she's among 4,000 Americans and Canadians who filed a trillion dollar lawsuit against defendants that include Saudi charities, members of the royal family, and bin Ladens. The suit claims that by funding Osama bin Laden, they were just as responsible for the 9-11 tragedy as the hijackers. If this will cost the Saudis enough money, I think maybe they will think twice before they will sponsor terrorism again. I think that if we hadn't brought this lawsuit with the larger number of people that are involved in the lawsuit, that it would have taken a very long time for the name of Saudi Arabia to even be mentioned by our government. Elizabeth Alderman's life has changed in many ways. For one, she says, she's never been as suspicious of her government as she is now. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I certainly can understand why people would believe it because it doesn't make sense. An awful lot of the way I look at life is things have to make sense. I may not be knowledgeable in a particular area, but I know when things don't make sense. So has all of this made any difference whatsoever in Washington? This past summer, U.S. Senators held a hearing on the financial support of terrorism. They asked government officials to provide the names of the Saudi charities and individuals who've been investigated for funding Al-Qaeda. I know the chairman tried very hard and others have tried very hard to get this information, so let me try again. Okay. Are the names of those entities classified? The names classified that you have recommended for listing? It's a yes or no question. The names themselves are not classified. Then I think you ought to present them to us today. I don't have them with me. Mr. Newcomb, Senators were promised they'd get the names the next day. But overnight, the Bush administration classified them. That list, with the names of the Saudis suspected of financing Osama bin Laden, would not be made public after all. Call it a conspiracy, or call it the way of the world, but the long relationship between the Bushes, the bin Ladens, and the Saudi royal family has shaped the times in which we live before and after September 11th. For better, for worse, and for whom? You be the judge. Naturally, we wanted the Saudi perspective on all of this and tried repeatedly to get it, but we were turned down. The Bush family and the White House have also been silent on the subject. But there's a lot more information connected with our story on our website. So go to cbc.ca slash fifth and read on. I'm Bob McEwen for everyone here at the Fifth Estate. Thank you for watching. Good night.